basically on uh, the profiles of passion and courage uh, to show how servant leadership principles are uh, learned throughout the different stream specializations can be applied in the workplace. So our presenters are going to be uh, Janice Nickel, who uh, also graduated with a business specializer, uh, business stream specialization, she was actually in my cohort, and uh, now serves as a development officer for the Wellspring Foundation. Uh, there's a, a great little table set up out there, you can learn more about that. Uh, she works with uh, two other MA lead alums, Richard Taylor, oh I guess, uh, <laughs> um, and uh, Stephen is the CEO of the Evergreen Baptist Home in White Rock. Uh, second speaker will be Phil Hills, who graduated with an educational leadership specialization, specialization and works with uh, Christian and independent schools. And Linda Vandersees, who uh, graduated with a health leadership special, special, specialization. I'm done. Uh, so, without further ado, uh, Janice, would you like to come up for? Many, many years ago, um, there was a guy named John Page who you, you guys have maybe heard about or took classes with if you've got that opportunity. He has been a speechwriter in Ottawa under three different prime ministers, and I had the chance to meet him when I was like a teenager. And um, when he came to Trinity to check out working here in, back in 1989, I went up to him after chapel and I wanted to just say hello to him. He comes up to me and goes, Chance Johnston, good to see you again. And I'm like, he knew my name. He remembered my name, and I just never forgot the impact that was that this man had remembered my name. And then I had the chance to talk to him after. I said, why did you want to come to Trinity from Ottawa when you left this prestigious position of such influence? And he said, he was challenged. What are you doing to multiply yourself? And so that is how he came to Trinity, where he ended up starting this Master's of Leadership program. And I am, I am honored to have been a, a graduate of this program, but at the end of our class, our cohort, we made a t-shirt saying multiplied on the back of it, and then signed it with our class's names because we were part of this cohort that uh, a multitude of people have been part of it. Um, so for the past two and a half years, uh, I was, I've had the privilege of working with an organization called Wellspring, the Wellspring Foundation for Education. It was started by a guy who just graduated from this MA lead program, Richard Taylor, and some other people. But uh, I, I kind of feel like I hit the jackpot. I have, not only the, is, is the founder a graduate of Mal, 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 the MA lead program, but also uh, our chairman of the board graduated with the MA lead. And then there's a number on staff who've also been part of the program. I'm thinking, man, this is just the ultimate to work in an organization that has servant leadership at its heart. We, uh, Wellspring has been, uh, start, started in 2003. I'm going to give you a little bit of a story about how it started and then tell you our story. Wellspring is committed to empowering Rwandan nation with, with hope for their future. <coughs> and uh, they're committed to being good stewards of the resources that they've been entrusted with, um, exercising servant leadership at every level. And uh, I want to give you a little perspective. The Wellspring works in this little red area called Rwanda. It is one of the smallest countries in Africa, also one of the most densely populated in the whole world. I think all of Africa, for sure. And uh, that gives you an idea of it's landlocked. There's no natural resources except its people. So that is what we're investing in. And uh, I wanted to tell you that, that I'll show you where it was, because this is where our story begins. It all started in 2003 when Richard Taylor, Jeff Comont, and a few other guys who had just graduated from Trinity Western went on a safari after their graduation. They just went to Africa, they were going to spend six weeks, there was no motive that we're going to go change the world, we're going to go on a safari, we're going to climb Mount Kilimanjaro, we're going to paddle the Nile River. But when they got to Rwanda, where Jeff's parents had been uh, just starting a church up, they saw such devastation. and. It impacted them uh, right here. And I think as servant leaders, that's something that you know you're in the right place when your heart is stirred and it creates a passion that you have to be part of the solution. So they, um, they realized, okay, what can we do to help make a difference? So Jeff Comont, whose parents are pastoring there, uh, after they got back from Africa, he asked Richard, would you want to be part of something with me? And they did, they took on this challenge. and. Uh, this is their story. I'm going to tell their story of how these two young men 
I've been practicing servant leadership since 2003, so almost 11 years now. Um, it's made a difference in the lives of nearly 50,000 young Rwandan children, their families, and their teachers. In 1994, many of you heard in the media about a genocide that killed nearly a million people. Uh, it's been compared to three 9-11s every day for 100 days. It decimated the country. The education system, the infrastructure for health care, uh, government was completely uh, destroyed. And um, when these guys had been to Rwanda, it was seven years after the genocide, but it was still in complete chaos. And uh, they wanted to make a difference. So they... Um, this, I show this video. This is a video we made it's called Rwanda Hope Rises. It's an excellent award-winning film that I highly recommend you guys look up on the internet and pick up a copy because it's so inspiring. It's so hope-filled when there seems to be so little good news that comes out of a country. This is a story of good news. But Richard and Jeff started asking questions to Rwandans. How can we best help you? It was about empowering the Rwandans. It wasn't about us coming in to make a difference. It was about empowering the people who live there to empower their own people. And uh, they, the, the people there, they, they, they started with teachers. And they said, the greatest need, they said, was help our teachers. Um, by this point, these young men were 23 years old. Um, and though they didn't let their youth dissuade them from wanting to make a difference. In Rwanda, 40% of the population is under 15, so this was a unique opportunity to kind of make a difference in the lives of these young people. And today, if the population is still quite young, and uh, this generation has not seen, did not see the genocide firsthand. So we're working with people who have a fresh vision, a fresh hope for their future, and coming alongside them. So Richard and Jeff started by offering workshops for teachers which evolved into the Wellspring Academy. And their vision is not to be served, but to serve. And so the, from the top down right to the janitor, their vision is to serve their people and these children. And because it's a Christian school, now considered one of the top schools in all of the country, these are gonna be the future leaders of this, of this country. They're just getting a profound education. We started a secondary school already. So we'll have up to 600 children very soon at this academy. So that was exciting. We were able to, to help get this school started. It's a great uh, flagship for Wellspring in Rwanda. But realizing how do you make a difference so that it expands even further. So they started the school development program. And this is the area I partner with within Wellspring. And I love that we're a team. We work together. Uh, if there's a gap somewhere, we try to fill in holes each other. So this emphasis on teamwork is very, very, very strong within Wellspring. Also empowering each other to, to do and move forward so that it's not just this one-man show. Richard Taylor is my boss. He's 31 years old. But he doesn't even like me call my boss. The boss. He, he's just part of the team. It's quite a, it's quite this, this whole servant-led uh, philosophy. But uh, this, this school development program, we now have uh, 10 teacher trainers in 41 Rwanda public schools, and they're empowering teachers with skills and, and tools to make a difference. Because if you're a teacher in Rwanda, typically uh, you're there because you failed your national exams. You're there because it's no, there's no better job, and you typically need two, two jobs to pay your bills. Uh, if you're a teacher in Rwanda, you're usually in a classroom that has 60 to 100 children. Uh, you're there with low, low morale, high absenteeism. And uh, so our programs coming in have made such a difference. But I'm going to tell you one little story. Uh, one man, one teacher who had been part of this program and gone through our teacher training program, he came back to his students. He'd been known as a teacher who beat his students and verbally berated them. And he came down on his knees before his students and he said, I am so sorry the kind of teacher I have been, and I will never be that kind of teacher again. And he said, he, he, you know, for any, any person to get on their knees and beg forgiveness for the kind of behavior you've had is a big deal. For, for a, a man to do that is pretty humbling, and for an African man, it's very humbling to get on your knees. And you know that the difference that forgiveness and reconciliation, reconciliation can make in the lives of people can have a transforming impact on the culture, on the uh, culture of a school and the culture of an organization. So the, the, the school development program continues to expand. We've just hired <coughs> nine new teacher trainers, and we're empowering more Rwandans to empower more Rwandans, and the difference is expanding. We have uh, positioned ourselves as a small little organization that's now at the hub of a bunch of uh, NGOs throughout Rwanda. 
And so we're doing the, uh, I love being that. We do a lot of collaboration. And that's something you'll learn in, in servant leadership is that no, no one can do it all. No one, no one can be it all. No one organization can do it all. But when you collaborate with other people, then you uh, invite um, the possibility to expand even exponentially. And so um, I just want to say MA Lead has had an important role in helping Wellspring grow and develop. Professors, students, and graduates who've worked directly with the Wellspring Foundation include our founder, Richard Taylor, Stephen Bennett, our board chair, myself, Rachel Comont, she uh, works right in Rwanda. She's the uh, other co-founder's sister. She's a teacher there. Ron Shoemaker was a former board member, and Dr. Mike Richardson has also taken teams over to Rwanda and is a big, big uh, team supporter of our organization. But there's been tons of others who have been very much a part of what Wellspring has been doing. And uh, I invite you to come afterwards and have a chat with me at the table outside. I'd be delighted to share with you opportunities if you want to you know, come on a vision trip, if you feel like you'd like to partner with one of our teacher trainers. It's kind of like sponsoring a, a teacher. And um, so MA Lead and its transformational servant leadership principles are alive and well through Wellspring, both here in Canada in our small little staff and in Rwanda, where we have a staff of about 40. And uh, I think that's it. Thank you. Servant leadership practices are simple, but they're not simplistic. You can, you can understand the principles within one course. And those of you that are in the program understand, I think, enough now to be able to articulate publicly what it means to be a servant leader. But the application of servant leadership practices change, changes in subtle and powerful ways in every single interaction that you have. It requires not just knowledge and skill, but experience and wisdom, and maybe more than anything else, faith and humility. As a, an educator who uh, now has the privilege of working with educators all over the world through my organization, ACSI, I am watching the world being transformed one student at a time. You need to know that right now in the world, the fastest growing educational movement is the founding of Christian schools. In Africa, about every five minutes, a new Christian school opens up. In places like China, where Christian schools are illegal, the number of underground Christian schools that are currently operating is absolutely spectacular. And all over the world, I'm meeting people that believe the transformation of nations begins with the transformation of the youngest student, begins with a level of relationship building with parents, with teachers, with administrators that inculcates a Christ-centered heart into every person, gives them a desire to pour their lives out in support of something bigger than themselves. In my own practice, while I was taking my master's here at Trinity Western, I encountered probably one of the most challenging moments uh, in, in terms of uh, my leadership and in terms of applying servant leadership practices in the setting that I was working in at the time. It happened this way. We had an open enrollment Christian school. So, Anybody could come and register their child. We didn't just make a school for Christian parents. It was for any parent that wanted a great education for their students. On this particular occasion, I got a phone call from a woman who had a special needs child, and she wanted to enroll that child in our school. But before the conversation was over, she added this. You need to understand something. I'm in a relationship with another woman. Now, we had a number of couples in our school that were living together. And so there was no reason in the world where I, where, that I could go to this woman and say, I'm sorry, but you don't qualify, because she did qualify. But we did have a concern. With every parent that came to our school, we had to be very clear on what their children were going to learn, because those kids would potentially question their parents' choices as a result of what they were learning at the school. More than this, same-sex rights is a politically charged issue and at the time, there had been some attempts by a politically active group to undermine the credibility of independent schools here in British Columbia. And so there was a little bit of a concern that this was not a couple of concerned parents, but it was actually something deeper and bigger, a political move to discredit us. So with an incredible amount of humility and prayer, 
we approached the day where the couple came to talk to us about enrolling their child. And the entire time that we were preparing for this encounter, my one prayer was, God, help me to show your love to these people. Help me to demonstrate the reality of Jesus Christ, the one who spoke to the woman at the well with more respect than anybody who had ever spoken to her in her life. And so when they came and sat down with me, I decided not to play the game, not to walk lightly, but just to get right to the heart of the issue. And this is what I said to these two women. I said, you need to understand something. I can guarantee that my staff will treat you with the utmost respect. I can't guarantee how the parents will treat you, though. And at that point, they both chuckled and they said, well, it can't be any better than we're being treated at the public school that we're in right now. And then I added this. I said to them, I, I'm going to say some things that are pretty hard to you. I'm going to make it very clear what we teach here because there's a strong possibility that after a while of being in the school, your daughter's going to go home and potentially question the life choices that you've made. Because here's the bottom line. According to the Word of God, in order for us to be with Him, to be in a relationship with Him, we have to completely conform to His standards. In other words, we have to trust fully in His Word and in His way. And we are very discriminatory at this school. We discriminate against all sinners, and we will define your lifestyle as being sinful. But then I added this. I said, but I want to make something very clear to you. The worst sinner in the room is not you two. It's the one that's doing the interview with you right now. I'm a far worse sinner than you have ever been in your lives. And here's why. Because I've been a believer for 25 years, and yet I still persist in my unfaithful rebellion against my father. I am not perfectly obedient. There are times that I deliberately and intentionally do things that I know I should not do. So if anybody in this room deserves to be thrown into the lowest pit of hell, it is not you two, it is me. And then I continued and I said something. You two must be desperate for something that you don't have. Because to live together in a relationship like yours in my little town here in BC is a bold choice and it can't be easy. And they agreed with me on that one. And then I said this to them. I bet you haven't found what you're looking for yet, have you? And they didn't respond. They just looked blankly at me. And then we moved from that point onward, and I said, you know what? I want to tell you something. I found the true desire of my heart. His name is Jesus Christ. And he loved me from the beginning of eternity into the end of eternity. Of course, it'll never begin. It never started, never ends. And I believe he loves you too, and I believe he wants to give you what you're looking for. And so if you enroll your child at our school, you will hear that over and over and over and over and over again. And our agenda in this school will be to love you into the presence of the God that loved you from before time. They didn't say much to that. <laughs> then we talked about some boring things like school policy and the kind of programs that we have. And then at the very end of the conversation, I looked at them point blank and asked them a direct question. I said, I know you've heard that Christians are hateful and intolerant people who have no time for people that make choices like yours. I want you to be honest with me. Have I been hateful and intolerant to you today? And I made it very clear that their lifestyle would, would lead them to hell. I made it very clear that Jesus is the only way. I tried to be as direct in articulating the truth of the word as I could. And it even surprised me when they both looked at me and said, you haven't been intolerant at all. And then I asked them if I could pray for them. One of them immediately said no. <laughs> but the other one, who seemed to be the leader in the relationship, looked at me and she said, okay, I don't think it'll do any harm. <laughs> the one that had said no said to me, well, it won't convert me. <laughs> and I said, I couldn't convert you. That's not my job. My job is to love you. My job is to point you to the deepest desires of your heart and to serve you in whatever way will make that possible. And then I prayed for them. I said, oh God, will you please bless these women by allowing them to find what they're really looking for? Because they haven't found it yet. I know they haven't. Because they will continue to be restless until they find their rest in you alone. And will you bless their daughter and put her in the best school that she could be in? 
Amen. And when the conversation was over, they got up, they went, and they had a conversation with some of my other staff members. In the end, they chose not to put their daughter in the school because they found a private program with tutorial services that met their needs. But in the process of having that conversation, I discovered a few things. The first is this. When you really, really love people, you can tell them the truth in the most direct way possible. And if your attitude toward them is not one of fear and, and, and manipulation, but one of simple service, simple wanting to make their lives as good as you possibly can, wanting to take them from where they are to where they could be, doing whatever you need to do to make that happen, the potential of changing a life and therefore changing the world is spectacular. I heard earlier a question that was asked about how, how do you change a, a, a mentality that, that covers an entire country about the use of energy? My answer is simple and not simplistic. You do it by living Jesus Christ in whatever context you're in every single day. And at its, at its heart, it means putting the interests of others before your own. And when you do that and, and understand the complexity of that reality in your setting, people notice and people want what you found. And as more and more they gather together, things change. Thank you.